Well, you're stuck with me. Dave's back this week. Um, so I'm preaching. So, um, is that, that was my daughter. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Who else would it be, right? Um, so the song that we sang, that Dean and the crew sang, um, What a Beautiful Name, I asked him this week if he could sing that because the, the message um, is going to come in different parts. It's heavy, and the back end is restoration. So I just want you to kind of pick one of those lines just to meditate on that through the message. My sin was great. His love was greater. Okay, so we're going to talk about old Simon Peter this morning, and uh, before we get started, I just, I just want to pray um, that God would lead us and, uh, and help us to understand his word. Father, thank you for the great privilege it is to preach your word this morning, and Holy Spirit, we need you to uh, speak to us. God, may my weakness not be a stumbling block. Lord, may you be able to speak clearly to each of our hearts. We all need to hear your word in a special way each week. So God, may we leave um, filled by you, encouraged by you, and challenged by you. In Jesus' name, amen. I feel like I'm not going to be able to wander with this thing. Who can tell that set up for Dave? <laughs> I, I, I tried to get up on it once, and uh, that'll be it. I don't even know how to adjust it, probably this thing, but... We'll just leave that. Luke 22, okay? Simon, Simon, verse 31. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. So who's heard of Gallup polls? Probably if you're a little older, you may have heard of Gallup polls. So here's one we're not picking on Americans, because some of us may be, or we're at least connected to. We could probably transfer that into Canadians as well too. But So in 1950, there's a Gallup poll, um, and they asked uh, high school seniors, are you a very important person? And in 1950, 12% felt that they were important people. So they asked the same question in 2005 to high school seniors. And 80% said, yes, I'm a very important person. I find it interesting when I was looking through that little illustration that has, as, as we've moved away from you know, kind of a gospel culture of serving one another and esteeming others greater than ourselves into kind of our modern, contemporary, my rights, my freedoms. You know, we kind of go from that 12% into 80% quite, quite easily in thinking that we're the most important person. Um, I don't know if we've produced more mirrors or something. I'm not really sure. One of the apps on your phone is a mirror, so you can look at yourself. Time Magazine also asked Americans, are you in the top 1% of earners? 19% of Americans are in the top 1% of earners. And Americans score 25th in the world in math. But if you ask Americans, are you really good in math? They'll often say yes. They are number one in math in the world at thinking they're really good at math anyways. So what do we know about old Peter. He's a kind of a confident fellow, right? So Peter, Peter has some confidence. Um, Jesus knew that he was overconfident, and Satan knew that Peter was overconfident. Apparently, Peter was the only one who didn't know that he was overconfident. So Satan knew it so well that he asked Jesus to sift him. And Jesus knew how likely that could happen. And he knew how disastrous it would be if Peter was sifted. 
He knew that it would be disastrous to his church. So what did Jesus do? He prayed for Peter. Jesus knew that Peter's faith would be shaken and quite possibly it could have failed. So we know the only sin that's un, the un, only unforgivable sin, and we check, we're going to do a lot of running here in Scripture because I don't know much. I just have to go to the Bible for my answers all the time. So Matthew 12, 31, And if I tell you every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. It's real simple, right? We go back to math. If we reject Jesus, the Holy Spirit is what calls our heart. And if we reject that call of the Holy Spirit, then that sin can't be forgiven, that sin of salvation, right? It's real simple. Like, everyone's wearing red, and if you want to be part of the group, you wear red. And if you don't choose to put on red, you're not part of the group, right? So if we deny the call of the Holy Spirit in our life, then that's the unforgivable sin, correct? So Romans 10.9 says, If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there were grave consequences for Peter denying Christ and continuing to deny Christ is very great because he borders right on the line of apostasy if that's the case. And Satan knew that if he kept knocking and that if he got his way when he asked God, I demand that I can sift Peter like wheat. Who knows what a sifter is? We don't know exactly what that one may have looked like, but it's probably we're putting the weed in here and we're sifting it. So Satan asked to sift Peter and the rest of them in the sifter. But what can't come out of that sifter? Faith. So Jesus prayed for Peter that his faith would be strong because it was great if he didn't have it. So, you know, we're overconfident people, some of us a lot, maybe some not so much, but we have certain areas of our life that we're we're confident and maybe overconfident. Um, We can be overconfident in some things, but to raise some type of confidence that we have in our body, we have to have discipline. And as Jesse had mentioned, the... What's it called, the challenge? Lifestyle the lifestyle change challenge. It's built on discipline, okay? Discipline is something we need to practice to achieve, correct? So we need to discipline ourselves in order to become disciplined, right? So the journey is the achievement and not the achievement itself, right? If we're disciplined people, it's not an event, right? It's a continuing on in our discipline. So verse 32 um, we're going to break this off into a couple of little spots here. So, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brother. So we're going to do part A here. So, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith would not fail. So Jesus prays for us. He allows us to experience life at the same time. Can anyone amen to that? So there's difficulty. Some are very great. Some are small. They're just bumps in the road through the week, and some are very great. You know, you heard the expression that hindsight is twenty twenty. Well, praise God that he has the twenty twenty hindsight vision. But because of that, he'll kind of allow us to go only so far, right? And that's what he did with Peter. He had a plan for Peter, and he had a plan for his church. The church that he was about to die for. Who knows the the context right here? It's just before the garden. We're we're working our way into um, the crucifixion. Dark, dark day. So Peter um, was going to be one of the leaders of that church. So Jesus had the plan. The road ahead was going to be very rough. 
And it wasn't going to be straight for those next number of days. And that could be similar to our lives. We could be in a difficult situation right now. Or coming upon one. And the road may not be straight. But our faith can be strong. So Peter needed to be humbled. And he needed to realize who his Lord was. Because in verse 33, he says, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. How did that shake out? What did he do? He denied him. So we're confident, folk, and it's good to be confident. But Jesus knows our weakness. And because he knows our weakness, he prays for us. And he strengthens us in the back end, behind the scenes. The cross... um, Paul said in Galatians 6, 14, May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The cross is where all of us become someone. The cross is where our new life began. May we not boast in our past life that was characterized by sin and selfishness, Um, but we want to boast in the cross of Christ. So Peter's intentions were good, but maybe his faith was not based in that. It may have been based in his own confidence. In part B of verse 32, but I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus prevented Peter from becoming an apostate. He girded up his faith. You know what girding your loins means? Anyone? Jarvis, you got a hand for me. You would know what that means. So so when back in that day when they had their garb on and they had their loins, and when they were going to run, they had to get somewhere, they would gird them up so they wouldn't trip on them. Real practical. So one thing we got to see here is is Jesus allowed Peter to suffer. And then he led him back. And why did he lead him back? He led him back to strengthen his brothers. Has anyone failed here before? It's not just let's fail for the sake of failing and feel bad about yourself and, and condemned. But there's a purpose. Jesus allowed him to fail. That he would find the strength in his Lord. Jesus prayed for him that it would only go so far. And he found his strength in Christ. In John 6.39, And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given to me, but raise them up on the last day. Do you find any joy in that? If anyone's drifting, let's come back just for a moment. Whom Jesus calls and who he dies for, no matter what that storm is, whatever it is, Jesus will lose none of you. And you could just imagine the feeling that Peter would have had when that rooster crowed for the last time. He's denied him the three times that Jesus said he would. And the word says that when Jesus went by with the guards and they locked eyes and Jesus knew. So the rejection possibly that you could be feeling right now for something in your own life, I've gone too far. And if you're worried about that, I can't remember who it was, but someone came to me, I think, last week when I preached a while ago in talking about that. We go so far, right? But there's restoration. So Jesus allowed Peter to go so far, but he's not going to lose Peter, and he's not going to lose any of you who have called upon the name of Jesus. No matter how dark life can be, the choices that you've made, he's going to lose none of you. 
Philippians 1.6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. How do you feel about Jesus being at the wheel? I just did one of those carry underwood things or whatever. <laughs> Take the wheel off. He's going to carry it on to completion, right? There's ups and downs around the mountain, up the mountain, down the mountain, around the side. But he's going to continue that work that he's created in you until it's completed, until he comes back for you. So Jesus called Peter to himself. Peter walked with Jesus for three years. And by Jesus' power, Peter accomplished much. But greater was yet to come. So we look at maybe some areas of our own life that things aren't going that well. And we may have stretched really far and we just don't know what's happening with our faith. And it's wandering, it's wavering, or it may not even exist. And I have no idea why you're, you're here. You've come this morning. You're just not sure. Peter walked with Jesus, Jesus himself, for a few years. And just blind people healed. Deaf people got hearing again. Dead people got raised. Water to wine. Bread, fish. It's like Costco, Right? All kinds of incredible things. And what did Peter do? The first big test. He denied Jesus. Right? But Jesus restored him. And if I can be an encouragement to you, if you're concerned at all that you're not in the right place with God, if you're concerned, like I mentioned a moment ago, that's a really, really good sign. If you don't care, don't feel comfortable. If you feel concerned that you're not right with God, that's very good. So John 14, 12. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus was on his way to the Father. The crucifixion was going to be cruel and agonizing. But Jesus knew, as the word says, that when they strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And the sheep was struck. And he knew that they were going to scatter. He knew that Peter, um, the suffering Jesus told Peter, you'd be restored in order to strengthen your brothers. Because verse 31 says that Satan desires to sift all of you. And the NIV, which is where we're working out of, I won't get into the Greek because I have no idea. But it is a plural, depending on where your translation is, but it is a plural that Satan desired not just to sift Simon Peter, but all of you. So Peter was going to lead that charge of coming back in restoration. So if you're, if, if you're in a family, if you're a dad, the wife and kids, um, husband, obviously, if your family is going to suffer something great, if you are suffering something great and a big loss, dads, you've got to strengthen your family. You're the leader of your home. If you're a single mom, if you're a leader at your workplace, if you're a business owner, if you're a leader in a community group, whatever it is, if your organization is sailing through really dark, rough waters, and you're the leader, you're the director, you're the coach, you need to think clearly, you need to be disciplined, and you need to execute that recovery plan for the sake of your team. Peter was one of the leaders of that crew. And Jesus knew the consequences of him not having that recovery plan. What about your pastors? People ask me, I met met different people through different mornings, and you're a pastor here, and it's still very difficult to say that because it doesn't seem like that is the case, but I guess that's what my name tag says. 
We've got a pastoral team, right? There's me, there's Seth doing the same thing at Brantwood. You know, we've got Sarah, we've got Micah coming on, we've got Pastor Dave, we've got leadership with Linda and with Todd, and all the way through, we've had, a, all of us have been up here at different times, a leadership um, in the church. So Jesus knows that leadership needs to be strong. And he knows that they need to be strengthened so they can lead the followers, the other laborers in the faith. How often do you pray for your pastors? This is a question. How often do you pray for your pastors? What would happen if one of them would fall? morally, ethically, in a criminal way. What's at stake for one of us to fall? Let's look in the context of Peter. What was at stake if Peter denied his faith and became an apostate? What was at stake? A lot, right? So let's bring it right down to here, Salisbury Road, down at Brentwood on Dixon Boulevard, our campuses. What is at stake if one of us fall? I'll tell you a little story. So I was a brand new Christian, like real new, like a couple years into the faith, something like that. And I was involved with a church plant. Probably my re- first place I really settled at a church as I was getting some traction in my faith. And there was a church plant that started with three families in 2000. I think it was actually the first weekend in January, first, first weekend in 2000. And within two years, there was over 100 people regularly at that church on Sunday morning uh, as a regular thing. And we experienced, it just, a, it shaped my early years in my faith. And incredible things happened. The amount of people getting saved, people coming back from just living wayward for years. It was just an incredible time. Very, very sweet time with the Lord. And then our pastor befriended a guy in the community, a down and outer. He needed the Lord. He needed help in life, period. He befriended him. And we're trying to minister to this guy. And all the while, he's got a plan. He's like a Judas. And he starts seducing our pastor's wife. And he wins. So she starts having an affair. And it all comes out And it was like TNT exploding. He resigns from the ministry. He's devastated. He leaves the ministry. His faith in life is just in ruins. Within two years of that, there's 20 people out at the church. So we go from 100 and growing, and there's weeks where there's even more, but consistently, and just enjoying sweet times. The disciples are walking along, enjoying sweet times of fellowship, and their Lord tells them this is what's going to happen. I just want, I don't want to get, I don't want to get real somber with you, but I just want to make the context here. That your leadership is important. And we're all very weak. And our strength comes from the Lord. And we need to be praying for each other. And you need to be praying for your leadership. Because there's a lot at stake. Who has kids here? Do you pray for your kids every day? Who has grandkids? Do you pray for your grandkids every day? Who's married? 
some people were just kind of. <laughs> Do you pray for your spouse every day? I just like it to be a habit in your lives. We love our government. We need to pray for them. Whether you love them or just like them a little. So we need to pray for our government. You know what's coming up soon? All the parents are pretty excited about this. School. We need to pray for teachers. We need to pray for our military. We need to pray for our police officers. It's important there's a lot at stake, right? There's a lot at stake. Jesus prayed for Peter. He knew what was going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen, but we're called to pray. And I don't think, I don't think it's a special Christian who prays. I don't think that's a special Christian. And I want to challenge you that that's the norm, right? I think if you have a lack of prayer in your life, I'm going to offend somebody here, and that's just all right, all right? If you have a lack of prayer in your life, you have a lack of relationship with Jesus. Some of you may be burning holes in my head right now with your eyes, but if you know the Lord, you know the Lord, okay? A pastor used to say to me at a church from years ago, he would say, and we're not just tossing one up to the Lord, right? We don't just chuck one in, right, as we're doing our scratch tickets, right? It's a Baptist church. I shouldn't have said that, right? A deep relationship with God. So who knows Lecrae? Any young ones in here? He's a Christian rapper. Some of you older folks might not listen to him too much. I don't know. I don't even listen to him. Lack of prayer says that you have bought into the lie that life is manageable and you have everything under control. Anyone recognize that? Who knows Leonard Ravenhill? I thought some of the older folks would know. Leonard was a hellfire and brimstone revivalist preacher. Hardcore. I think he passed away in the 80s. So just, just to kind of date where he was, some of the terminology. Our spiritual immaturity never shows more than in our lack of prayer. Be it alone or in a church prayer meeting, let 20% of the choir members fail to turn up for rehearsal, and the choir master is offended. Let 20% of the church members turn up for a prayer meeting, and the pastor's elated. We don't even have a prayer meeting anymore, do we? Right? Before Easter, Lent time, we would pray before service. And four or five of us would show up. Half of them would be staff. Right? It should, I want this to be a groundswell amongst the people. That we're a praying church. That our dependence is on God. Who has had answered prayers? Just like, where did that come from? Let that spur you on every single day. And most of you remember, well, a lot of you would remember Harley Marr. So Har- I used to meet with Harley in his last days before he went home to be with the Lord. I would meet with him Thursday afternoons and pray with him. And when I met with him, um, I would go to encourage him. And if you know Harley, it turned out the other way around. So at the end, I was very, it was very difficult times, and it was very hard to pray for a man in that kind of condition. And he said to me, Kevin, he said, I got two choices. He said, I can either think about what God has not done for me, has not healed me, has not delivered me from the pain. The ag-. He couldn't sit still. He would lie down, he would stand up, he would bend over a chair. He, just, he had prostate cancer and, and bone cancer all through his hips. I can think of those things, and I'll be dead in a week. Or I can think of all the things the Lord has done. 
and I can find strength in that. He said the problem with Israel is when God showed up and did something great, they built a monument. And the problem is, is they would get further along and they'd start grumbling because they wouldn't look back at what God has done. So I want to quickly tell you that where God has answered that prayer in your life, may that be a monument that you journal, that you do whatever you got to do, that God answered that prayer. And may that spur you on to continue to pray and to ask God. I don't have a timer. I have no idea where I'm at. How am I doing, Todd? <laughs> Okay. Let's let's end with some scripture. Have something in your mind from the Lord. So in first Peter three eighteen, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit. The gospel is not just centered on getting you out of hell and into heaven. As Peter says, the gospel is bringing you to God. That's our role. That's our goal. So Romans 8 says, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God, and is also interceding for us. The dictionary says the word intercede means to act or interpose in behalf of someone in difficulty or trouble as by pleading or petition to intercede with the governor for a condemned man. Jesus intercedes for us today, not just back with Peter. He's praying for us today. Can we pray for one another? Can we be an encouragement for one another? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you pray for us. That you stand in the gap when you know what the future holds and we don't. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would grab our hearts and you would show us that we need to be a praying people, that our dependence needs to be on you. And God, in our weakness, I ask, please, that those who do not have a prayer life, that God, you would give them some victories, that they would find strength and faith in praying. In Jesus' name, amen.